Welcome to RPV City Talk. RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to RPV City Talk. Today for the first time here in our studio is Democrat State Senator Ted Liu. We are so excited to have you here because come December you will be representing our district here in, on the peninsula. So uh, welcome. Thank you. I'm uh, <laughs> very excited to be here as well and excited to represent. So because of redistricting, that's how now you, we will become part of, the Peninsula Cities will be part of the 28th uh, State Senate District. Talk about how that all happens and why that all happens. Sure. So uh, every 10 years, uh, because of the census, uh, we change our political districts. And this year it was done by an independent redistricting commission, and they drew maps. And the map that they drew uh, has uh, Palos Verdes Peninsula in a district. And the district goes from the peninsula along the coast, uh, through Santa Monica, all the way to Pacific Palisades. And then it goes east and it has uh, UCLA, Westwood, West LA, Beverly Hills, uh, West Hollywood, and parts of Hollywood. And so you have about a million constituents you're watching out after, right? <laughs> uh, yes, that is so, correct. So you've, you've inherited us, and then you said, like you mentioned, we didn't elect you for this spot, but come two years from now, you'll be up for, for re-election in this district, right? right? That's right. So what happened is in December, uh, the current state senator for this district, uh, Senator Rod Wright, uh, will take an oath of office uh, to his new district, which no longer includes the peninsula. The peninsula will then have no senator. And then the Senate will assign me, basically, uh, uh, on December 3rd. And the voters don't even get to vote for me, so that's correct. And I'll have a two-year grace period. And if people like me, they can vote for me in re-election in 2014. So that's how it's going to work. Well, that's very exciting. Um, let's talk a little bit about your background to introduce you to the community so they get know, to know more about yeah. you. Um, I did a little bit, a little bit about you from the time you were three and you immigrated here and just your story that took you into Sacramento. So. Oh, well, thank <laughs> you. Um, well, so like many folks, uh, my parents came to America to seek the American dream. And, you know, I was thinking they could have picked beautiful California uh, or Florida. They ended up picking Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> so that's where I grew up. And uh, we uh, lived in the basement of a person's house. We went to flea markets and sold gifts and jewelry to make ends meet. Uh, did that for several years. Uh, then we opened one gift and jewelry store in a shopping center. Uh, we saved up some more money. Uh, and then several years later, uh, opened one gift and jewelry store in a shopping mall. My brother and I would help watch the store after school because you know we were free labor. Uh, and then my parents expanded uh, eventually to six stores. And in my mind, they had achieved the American dream. Uh, they went from poverty to a home, gave my brother and I an amazing education, and it's one reason I joined the U.S. Air Force on active duty. Because well. I believe I can never give back to America, everything the country has given to me and my family. And it's one reason I'm in politics, is to make sure this dream remains open to people who want to work hard and succeed. So you went to Stanford, and then you went to law school, at, was it Georgetown? Yes. And then from there, join the, uh, you were a prosecutor for the U.S. Air Force? I was a JAG, yeah, uh, correct. I was a prosecutor um, for the U.S. Air Force as a JAG. And um, that's how you came to L.A., right? Is that what brought yes, you out here? Yes, and then I've also done duty uh, as defense counsel for the Air Force as well, and operations law, and, and the Air Force gives you a myriad of uh, different assignments. Uh, and what's your position? Are you, what, was it lieutenant colonel? What did uh, I read? So I did active duty for a little over four years, and then I've been in the reserves uh, since then for a total of 17 years, and I'm now at the rank of lieutenant colonel in the reserves. Okay, so then how did you end up uh, getting into politics? Uh, so, uh, one, I wanted to give back uh, to this country, but the second is I wanted to help fix things. And, you know, I would, I remember, uh, I would, you know, when I was in college or even high school, I'd read things in the newspaper and I'd be upset about them and said, we, this, how can this be? And we need to fix this, or this law is stupid, or so on. Um, so I got started. Uh, on the Torrance uh, Environmental Quality and Planning Commission. Um, actually, I'm sorry, Environmental uh, Quality and Energy Conservation Commission. And then uh, I was elected Torrance City Council uh, and then a state assembly in the state senate. So, yeah. But before um, politics, I was in the private sector. So I have uh, worked in a private sector law firm. I was then uh, a corporate vice president at a financial uh, services company, so I've been in the private sector as well, and I grew up in a small business. Right, and, and you live in Torrance? 
Yes, okay. I live in Torrance with uh, my family. And um, so 2005, you entered the Assembly, and then 2011, you were elected to the, to the Senate, is yes. that right? Yes, yes. So you're just, and so, but you're obviously very familiar with Sacramento. How does the climate feel right, right. now up there? You have a super majority with Democrats running the show. How, how does that right. feel? <laughs> um, so as a Democrat, it, it feels good, but I think um, it's important that we show we uh, are able to govern responsi responsibly uh, and fairly and in a balanced manner. Okay. I know we were talking, you've, you've been involved with a lot of legislation in just the year 2012. I think 13, bill, 15, 13 bills were signed in out of 15 bills right this year yes. by Governor Brown. That's, that's very uh, commendable. Oh, Congratulations on that. Um, and certainly some uh, very interesting, I feel like, legislation, one that received a lot of national uh, attention was the first of its kind ban on gay therapy. Talk about what that is. It certainly was controversial, right. but really important. Sure. Uh, so regardless of where you fall on um, the spectrum of how you view homosexuality, I think we can all agree uh, that parents shouldn't be harming their children. And what the studies have shown, what every major medical organization from the American Psychiatric Association to American Psychological Association has shown, is that if you do gay conversion therapy, which is when a therapist attempts to change a child's sexual orientation, um, it will cause them harm. Um, it makes them have feelings of depression, of guilt, um, of self-hatred, of suicidal thoughts, and some will commit suicide. Right. So the therapy uh, from the studies, uh, it shows that it just doesn't work. But in addition to that, it does cause harm in many of its patients. So I authored a first um, law to ban it for minors uh, under 18. And since then, um, other states uh, have introduced measures uh, to do that as well. So, And in the process, though, of coming up with this, did you get, um, in terms of people that were saying, what about parental rights? Right. I mean, what was the argument trying right. to prohibit such right. a measure? So, so I'm a big believer of parental rights. Um, and I have two young children. But parents are not allowed to harm their children. And it's the same reason that uh, we don't let children uh, buy whiskey at a bar, regardless of what their parents want them to do. We don't let children uh, buy cigarettes, uh, regardless of what their parents want them to do. So government has historically intervened when uh, it, uh, are trying to protect children from harm. And this therapy has caused people to uh, commit suicide and to have uh, years of their life uh, messed up psychologically. So of all the measures that you put forward this year, was that something that you're most proud of, or is... is uh, it is definitely one of, one of um, the measures that, yes, I am most proud of, because I believe it will save lives and also improve the quality of life for a lot of people. All right. What about some of the other legislation right. uh, measures that passed this year that you're really excited right. about? Uh, so, so it's interesting. Um, if you look at these, the 15 bills I submitted to the governor, for whatever reason, sometimes the media will focus on, you know, some of them and be totally therapy. silent on others. Right. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you about one, one of the ones that they're totally silent, but I think is incredibly important. Right. Um, it was legislation uh, on the economic workforce and development program. And my view uh, is that we're not going to succeed economically, economically in California making socks. Um, our land is too expensive, our cost of living is too high, we will never compete with other countries that can make socks at much lower prices. We succeed uh, in areas where we have a competitive advantage, things that we can do better than other states or other nations. So if you look at our economy, about 70% is driven in 15 different industry sectors. So we have a very robust high-tech area, uh, we have biotech, we have agriculture, we have our ports. So Switzerland is never going to have deep water ports, right? Idaho will never have ports. Uh, we have uh, an entertainment sector that's hard to replicate. So we have a uh, lot of uh, industries where we're doing quite well and we can compete. And my view is we have to focus, uh, on, focus on those sectors. So what this bill does is it brings together businesses. Uh, it's run out of the community college chancellor's office. It brings together higher education stakeholders and students and uh, workers and says, okay, what do businesses actually need in the next five or 10 years for the businesses? And we're gonna give grants to programs that train people for those skills that businesses need. Right. Um, and the governor signed the, the bill into law. And so I'm very excited about it, even though 
it's hard to explain, right? It took me a while right. to explain it, and, and maybe that's it's, why it's, it wasn't yeah, covered. You can't so. show a lot of pictures on television with that story. A lot Correct. of it has to do with what and how to tell the story. But we're glad you shared that on yeah. RPV TV, so well, the Peninsula well, residents will, will certainly get that. Um, one thing you've been making headlines in recent days was um, you were just this, this discussion about the possibility of putting a ballot measure out there that would increase the vehicle um, license fee. Correct. To bring money in to help with transportation projects. Correct. You first were pushing for that, and then you changed and decided to, to drop that. Talk Correct. about your position then and now. Sure. Uh, so uh, California has a infrastructure and transportation funding crisis. Uh, it has been underfunded for years. The California Transportation Commission did an assessment showing that we have a deficit of about $5 billion a year uh, for a state uh, wide infrastructure, and at local level, it's about another 1.8 billion for local roads. And our investment in transit infrastructure has a direct effect on our economy and our ability to grow. And so, for the last year and a half, I've been working with transportation stakeholders. Um, they've been doing focus groups, and the uh, voters were very supportive of having the vehicle license fee raised to fund transportation. This as was long as done. The money goes well, there, so, right? <laughs> so, so this was done though before the November elections, and before the elections, if you recall, we're in a mindset where the state just hadn't received any revenue for years and years and years. So we were just cutting. Um, after the elections, as you know, the voters passed Proposition 30. The voters, for the first time in a very long time, increased taxes. The state is now getting revenue, and I think it is important. Um, for Sacramento to show we can uh, use the revenue efficiently and responsibly and fairly uh, before voters are asked again to right. raise fees and taxes. And so when, you know, we worked on this, sometimes you're working so hard on a proposal and then you, you talk about it, you don't think about changes that have happened. And, you know, since this was announced, I've gotten a lot of um, constituents calling me and contacting me to my district office, to me personally, or through Twitter or Facebook. The majority of them were overwhelmingly opposed to it. Um, you what know, my, that, my what wife... That, what my, would that increase have meant, though, right. to the average uh, uh, it, it, so license? From 1948 to 2004, uh, the vehicle license fee was 2%. Um, right now, it's 0.65. So it would have uh, increased it, it by up. three... It would increase by three times to the two percent rate, um, but for some people that is a, a lot of money. Um, my wife told me she was going to lead a group to oppose the measure, <laughs> um, and I heard from a lot of constituents. And so, I um, thought about it. it. I didn't have a aha moment, but over a period of days, uh, I thought about it some more and I read the comments of people, and I came to the conclusion that um, I was incorrect. The and I so when you mentioned like it. Proposition 30 yeah. that passed, I know, for example, here in the school district, everyone was very excited thinking that money is going there. So yes. is that so, money is going to be going everywhere? Yes. No, no. <laughs> so Proposition 30 is going to education. Right. Um, as you know, part of it is also going to public safety. Uh, that okay. was in the ballot measure and right in title. But it's not going to transportation, right? Okay. And so there is uh, going to be this uh, funding um, crisis in transportation. I think it's important to talk about it, and that's what I'm going to do next year is to have people uh, learn about their transportation infrastructure issue and to explain what the problem is, and then we can work on ways to mitigate it. So what do you see right now as your biggest issue that you need to focus right. on? Um, well, so, being said, so growing the economy is huge. still the most important issue. Now, um, the good news is in the last um, year and a half, we've had 15 months of straight job creation. We actually created more jobs uh, last year than any other state at a higher rate. Our credit rating at the state level went from negative uh, to stable to now positive. So the trend is in the right direction. And if you read uh, Business Week, they had an article in September of this year that showed that California was actually outperforming every other state economically uh, in America. So you know to get um the residents here just right. to believe that because I feel like you always sort of hear this this sort of the pulse of the community is like you know California is in you know is that dark cloud still hanging right. over this state and there's a lot of opportunity here so you're starting to see sunlight come through uh, some of the clouds and 
you know, clearly our unemployment rate is still far too high, uh, but it has been trending down. It was, you know, 11.7% uh, around this time last year. It's now 10.1. 10.1 is still way too high. We need to drop that down even further. But it is trending in the right direction. All right. You got to walk before you run sometimes, right? Yes. Um, now that you are going to be in, uh, representing the peninsula, right. any particular issues you see that are of specific concern right here to the four cities on the hill? What, what, so, so certainly growing the economy is, but uh, the environment is very important both to me and to my constituents. Uh, the peninsula, obviously, is very coastal. My district is very coastal. Um, and, you know, I think preserving the coast, the coastline. Um, and we have tourists that come because of our coast. Also, I did uh, author a bill that the governor signed uh, this year that um, didn't get really any attention, but I think it's very important as well. So we know with climate change uh, that even if we just stopped all carbon activity right now, our uh, atmosphere is still heating up for the next century. We, we've already produced too much. We can't stop that from happening. So we know the ocean uh, levels are rising. And the issue is, well, what do you do when you have um, ocean levels rising and maybe flooding some areas? So I passed a law that authorizes the climate, uh, I'm sorry, the Coastal Conservancy to get funding from all sorts of sources to fund climate change adaptation projects along the coast. And so uh, maybe some of that will uh, be done in Peninsula uh, as well. We were talking earlier, just one of the concerns like here in this city and RPV would be to protect um, the city's collection of TOT, the transient occupancy tax, um, right. ever since the Terranea Resort. I don't know yes. if you've had a chance it's yet a to- It's a beautiful yeah, resort. Yeah, it's a beautiful resort, yeah, has opened its doors. This city has been able to you know, collect nearly, I think, $10 million in TOT right. funds. And there had been some talk in Sacramento, I was telling you about that there's a possibility that maybe they would reduce those dollars that would go to the cities, and I just didn't know where you would stand on something like that. I would oppose a reduction of uh, funds to the city. I also think uh, cities should have local control over uh, how they want to uh, collect it and allocate it. Right. Another issue in the city that really came up to head was last year was, again, pension reform. When the new year kicks in, the yes. state will be implementing right major pension reform as well. Um, and so the fact that they were sort of, last year sort of started implementing that, is that something you were seeing cities do around the state, sort of taking initiative and? So some cities did, uh, uh, some cities have done nothing. Um, but at the state level in August uh, of this year, uh, the legislature enacted bipartisan pension reform. Um, and so we, uh, for example, eliminated a lot of the abuses in the pension system, such as spiking your salary shortly before you retire, so your pensions right. were exponentially higher. Uh, we uh, extended uh, the age at which you can collect your full pension because people are living longer, and that's something right. you simply have to address. Uh, we um, put in a 50-50 uh, cost share uh, for employees. Uh, it was a number of factors that we put in that I think uh, have uh, improved the pension system. Okay. Um, anything in particular you're working on right now that you want the our residents to know? I mean, yeah. you're working on a lot of things. Right. I know that. So one of the great things I love about my job is um, I get to try to help fix problems. And one of the ways I get ideas on how to help fix problems is constituents just contact me. Or I go to a, a event and someone will say, here's a problem. And, is there a way to fix it? So um, I am open to a lot of new ideas. Uh, the, the bill deadline isn't until about the end of February. And so there's a lot of time between now and then if constituents want to contact me and, and right. ask me to work on certain issues, I'm happy to look into it or have my staff look into it. Right. And we talked about email is one way they can reach you. And it's senator.lu at Senate. SEN.CA.gov, we'll put that up on the screen. And they also okay. obviously can phone your office. They can phone my office. And you're busy um, on Twitter. If, if they yeah, can. so they can uh. just go to me on Twitter. It's just my name, at Ted Liu. Um, I also have a Facebook page they can post comments on. Right. So. What do you enjoy most about what you do? I mean, you say you want to fix things, right. but, you know. Uh, the ability to cause change, uh, hopefully for the better. Um, so I would love if every one of my bills became law. Clearly, that doesn't happen. Uh, but the ones that do become law are causing change. But even for bills that fail, uh, most of them, I believe, I'm able to advance uh, the issue. Um, 
So I'll give you an example. Um, I authored uh, a bill uh, when I was in the assembly that was going to basically say for commercial buildings uh, over 50,000 square feet uh, that were going to be built, that were new, um, in five years' time, they had to meet the LEEDS gold standard for green buildings. They had to get more energy efficient, uh, use more sustainable materials. Um, so Governor Schwarzenegger almost signed that bill. He waited till the last day, and he ended up vetoing it. But in his veto message, he said, basically, even though I'm vetoing this bill, I'm directing the Building Standards Commission in California to adopt green building codes. And so they ended up doing that. So they adopted their first set of codes. Uh, initially, they're voluntary, but eventually they'll make some of them mandatory. So um, it's not happening as fast as I would have liked, but I think it may not have happened at all had I not at least introduced legislation. So, so how would you rate your ability to work in a bipartisan way? Because some can do it better than others. And I think, obviously, you have, again, the supermajority. The Democrats control both houses, so you don't necessarily have to. But I think it's really important that, especially I was talking to young voters at Peninsula High School after the election, and they, all the bickering. I think it's yeah. such a turnoff for them. And how do you... How do you so, so for, I, to me, it doesn't matter um, whether it's a Democratic or Republican idea. I look for good ideas and good mm -hmm. policies to implement. And if you look at my history, I've had a very long history of bipartisan um, support. I've worked with um, Republicans on many measures. They've co-authored many of my bills. Uh, in fact, some of my most controversial bills, I actually, actually had some Republicans vote for the bill to help get it out. And so I've always had a, a good working relationship and will continue to do so because I believe the most effective way to govern is to do it uh, where you have as many stakeholders as possible. Right. Well, you are definitely well liked. I know you were when I talked again about this to you earlier about that. I read that in Governing Magazine, which is a national publication, you were voted the top 12 lawmakers to watch in this country, and the only one from California. So you know. Oh, well, what, thank you. Yeah. That, that that congratulations for that. So what? Thank you. What what, what 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 do you think that's coming from? Is it just? So I think part of it is if I've always worked on big issues and challenging issues. Um, I also worked across the aisle. And I think part of it is because I remember my first year in the assembly, I came to the conclusion that I love my job and I hate being away from my family. And I thought if I'm not doing the right thing, or if I'm not trying to make a difference, I really should just quit and go back to my family and make a lot more money in the private sector. So that's causing me to simply just take on big issues and try to move the ball forward. And sometimes I lose. and. Sometimes uh, I win, but I think I'm at least trying to make California a better place to uh, live, work, and play. And when you say move the ball forward, I know you were also involved in trying to get that a stadium and get football here in L.A. Because you're yes. a big football fan. I am. <laughs> a, I am a long-suffering Cleveland Browns fan. Um, so in terms of this football stadium in L.A., uh, I was an author of a bill uh, that basically said, look, if we're going to have frivolous lawsuits filed, then uh, we're going to bypass the trial court completely, go straight to an appellate court, require the decision within 179 days. And that could save years of litigation time. And I think that helped uh, the stadium project go forward. Um, and the NFL, first of all, has to get a team here, but I am um, cautiously optimistic that next year the NFL will announce a team will be moving here. All right. Um, the or, or the second option the NFL has is they can actually expand by two teams. They could just create two new teams as well. So that's another option that the NFL could do next year. Well, you're definitely optimistic, and we'll stay tuned for that. Maria Soraya, who's our sports girl, said, oh, it's never going to happen, but she's hopeful. Good. She, you know. A um, little bit about your, what you do in your downtime. You're very busy, obviously. Yeah. Uh, uh, legislating, but um, I know I read that you just finished a book called The Black Swan that you love, so do you have time to read books? <laughs> yes, yeah, so the book is, so it's called The Black Swan. It's nothing to do with the movie about ballet. Right. <laughs> it is actually by an author, uh, his name is a Mr. Taleb, T-A-L-E-B is his last name. Um, and it's a fascinating book because he actually in the book predicted our financial collapse uh, by Wall Street before it happened. Uh, he himself was a Wall Street trader, um, but he shows through a lot of um, logic and statistics and so on that there are some areas where you really can't model very well, and you just have to be able to acknowledge that and understand that you cannot predict and not try to um, build a lot of policies on predictions that are really nothing more than 
bad guesses. Right. Or base, I thought it was, you know, base sort of policies on what he calls the black swan, like when 9-11 hit, that, yeah. to try to really explain that. He almost didn't say it was useless, but because it's so rare correct. that you don't really right. have the answers to how that. Right. And so he describes. We spent a lot of time, though, thinking correct. we're going to get there. <laughs> correct. He explains a black swan, by the way, as a extremely rare catastrophic, cas catastrophic event. Right. Um, and so it was a good read. It was. So let, let me give you just one quick example, something just to think about. So he says, look, if you have 100 people in a room and you say, okay, what is their average height? You can get to a certain range. And if you add more people, let's say 1,000 people, you'll get even closer to a certain range. But if you said you changed the question and said, what is their average salary? You put in one Bill Gates. It completely skews everything by orders of magnitude. And he sort of explains that in the financial sector on, on Wall Street, that there is a lot of finances going on where they can't model it because you can have a situation like a right. black swan happening that totally upends everything and causes collapses. And so when you read so. this book, I think, I don't know whether you, I think yeah. whether it was on Twitter that you wrote it, it said this has sort of changed me. I mean, has it changed how you view things and how you're going to approach things? Or when, did that have an impact? Yeah, yeah it's, it, it's definitely made me uh, a lot more um, cautious when I read about predictions, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the financial sector. Um, so, so, you know, for, let's talk about pensions, right? So you have, for example, um, the Stanford group that came out and said our pensions are completely underfunded and we're going to have this huge crisis 30 years from now. So you then have CalPERS saying, no, our pensions are totally adequately funded and they're going to make this rate of return for the next 30 years. And I can tell you both sides are equally ridiculous because it's just a guess. They have no idea. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the black swan, it's funny, the author explains, and the people will say, well, but at least having some model is better than others. And he says, okay, let's say you're flying into LAX airport and someone gives you a map of Atlanta airport. Is that going to help you? <laughs> no, right? And so it, to be able to sort of understand when you look at predictions that really a lot of times that expert knows not much more than you do. Okay, well, everyone needs to put the yeah. black swan on their holiday list. Yeah, Sounds like a good one. As we sort of wrap it up, um, I know you're involved with a lot of different projects and all that. Anything you want to add that I didn't really cover that you just want Peninsula residents right. to know about you and the fact that you will be representing right. our community? Sure. So, one, I'm very, very excited to represent but the Peninsula. Um, and even before I had a Peninsula in my district, um, I would come here for different events, and uh, I really love the people here. And so I'm very excited. I um, want the folks to know I'm, uh, I try to be very accessible. And so if you ask me questions on Twitter and Facebook, I will try to respond personally. If you um, try to contact me in my office, we will try to uh, respond directly back to you and to uh, help you with your problem or answer your question. Okay. Well, we'll put that website up again that uh, people can check in with you and uh, check out also your your Senate web page. I got a lot of great information, a lot of background oh, about you, you, and it's uh, your and congratulations to to having our district. Thank you, and thank you for doing this show. Okay, really well, we'll have it. you back in here, I'm sure, many times now that you're going to be representing us. Great, thank you. Okay, and that'll do it for this edition of RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. See you next time.